Good morning, church. Come, let's rise and let's prepare our hearts to worship God this morning. I believe all of us this morning are excited. We're eager to worship God in His house. So let me just read from Psalm chapter 150, um, verse 1 all the way to verse 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with string instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Together. You'll be no reply. Death where is your skin? Conquered by the king. The resurrected one. Shining like the sun. Breaking through the fear. Victory is here. Victory is here now. Oh, oh, hallelujah. Oh, oh, hallelujah. Jesus be lifted higher. We serve the risen Savior. Risen, he's risen, forever glorified. Resurrected one, shining like the sun, breaking to the breaking to the feet. Sing together. Victory is here. Victory is here now. Oh, 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 hallelujah. Oh, 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 hallelujah. Jesus be lifted higher. We serve the risen Savior. She's risen, forever glorified. Risen, He's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is risen. He's risen, forever glorified. Risen, He's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is One voice, let's begin to declare it. The same power, same power that crushed the enemy. Same power, same power, same power lives in me. Same power, same power that crushed the enemy. Same power, same power. Same power, same power, that crushed the enemy. Same power. 
join together. Shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, 
pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out. We we'll sing one last time. If God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. We shout your name. We lift up your name, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Let's continue in this attitude of worship. Every knee 
bows before your name. But we will not wait until he dies. Come on. For here and now shall your kingdom reign. Why don't we sing the chorus again with one voice? The word of God says that if we don't worship Him, the stones, the rocks will cry out. If we don't worship Him here, when or where will we worship? Amen. As one church, as one voice, let's sing. We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. all the glory you are our savior you are our king of kings you are the lord of lords church why don't you just begin to lift up your voices right now begin to sing a new song to god sing your prayers worship him with your own words let's lift it up thank you jesus lift up your hands lift up your voices we worship you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a far test of glory divine. of God but of His Spirit washed in His blood perfect submission Wow. 
watching and waiting, looking up above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my soul.
praise God. Lord, you truly are wonderful. You are beautiful in this place. Lord, may we ever serve you. May we ever glorify your name. May we ever love and praise you, God. All the days of our lives. Thank you, God. Father, we pray that this morning, just as we sang unto you, God, Lord, that we will praise you. We will worship you. May our hearts remember, God, that you are Lord over our lives. Even as we go on from this place today, God, may we remember that you are God and you are in control. You are sovereign over every situation, over every circumstance, over this land even, God. We thank you. Lord, we praise you that we can call you God, we can call you sovereign. Lord, whatever is on our hearts, that's been on our minds these past few days, the past few weeks, the past few months, years, God, Lord, we bring them to you. I'm just reminded of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, that says that he uses everything. In fact, the word says, that it might have been meant for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that word that you have for us as a church. Lord, we pray, God, that you will continue to speak to us as we set aside this time for you, God. We praise you. Come, God, come and speak. We thank you, God. We praise your name. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. We bring all our praise to you this morning, God. We thank you, Father, that you are here. We thank you, God, that you are pouring out upon your church, Lord God. You have so much more to say, Father, through your word, and we're so excited, we're so eager to hear from you this morning. We praise you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering in this place. Thank you, worship team. May I invite us all to take our seats. We're going to go into a time of intercession. There's just a few points that we want to pray for this morning. So I ask that you would just grab a prayer partner and you would pray these things. So firstly, we want to pray for one another. I ask that you um, would pray that God would provide or help with whatever um, your, the person you're praying for needs. Whatever it is, uh, maybe we could just share with one another. What is it that we really need God to speak to us about this morning? Or what is it that we really need God to just not just speak about, but speak into? What situation is that? The second thing is that we would pray that as Christians, we would lead godly lives um, in peacefulness. And finally, I'm sure we know at least a friend um, or a family member, someone amongst us who needs him. Let's pray for their salvation. Let's pray for our friends, our family, the people around us would come to know God and come to know him as we do. All right, so let's just pray this with our prayer partner for about five minutes and then I'll come up and close.
Let's pray. Thank you, God. Father, we thank you so much, God, that we are here in this place, Father. God, that we can cry out to you and we know that you are listening. Father, we want to ask, God, that you would continue to make us more and more like you, Father. Lord, that as we seek you, as we read your word, as we pray, as we worship you, Father, God, that you will grow us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that as we do, Father, those around us will see your light shining through us. And many, many more people, Father, will come to know you, will come to know you and have you as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, we want to pray for those of us who have family members, who have friends, who we've been praying for, for months, years, God, who we want to know you, God. Lord, we pray, we thank you, God, that you hear the desires of our hearts and that, God, you place them there first, God. Lord, just as you say in John chapter 15, verse 7, as we abide in you, Father, ask what we wish and you will grant them because they are your, there are things that you want, Lord God. Father, we want to see our friends, our family come to know you, so, Father, we pray that you would provide us with opportunities to be a blessing to them. You would provide us with opportunities to share, God. Lord, that you would grant us a boldness of spirit to open our mouths, God, and share the word that you have for your people, God. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, I just want to ask that we would stand once more. We want to go into our gospel reading for this morning. And we're going to do this responsibly, which means that I'll read one verse, which is verse 37. And then you'll read 38, and I'll close with verse 39. So the gospel this morning is taken from John chapter 7, verse 39 to 37. Glory to Christ our Savior. Verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Verse 39. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Thank you, church. You may take your seats. Good morning, church. I hope you've come this morning eagerly expecting to receive from God because that's what he's going to do. He's going to pour himself out upon each and every one of us this morning. Do you believe that? Yeah, amen. This morning is Pentecost Sunday for those of you who do not know. And so we pray that God would continue to speak to us this morning about the Pentecost and about his spirit that he would pour out upon this church. This morning, we are so privileged to have um, a visiting pastor with us today, and I just ha I have the honor, the privilege to introduce him to each and every one of us. So this morning, we have Pastor Russell Abrahams. He is a retired uh, teacher as well as pastor, and he's currently here in Brunei to visit his daughter, whom some of us may know, Claire, as well as her family. He's here for the next few months. So in 2021, just for us to know a little bit more about um, the pastor, our pastor that will be speaking, us, speaking to us today, in 2021, he was invited to serve with the late John Stott's Langham Ministry in South Africa. And currently, he's still in the preaching movement, he's still the preaching movement coordinator, and he's tasked with developing trainers in expository preaching. So we have the honor to have him this morning with us to share the word. Let's welcome Pastor Russell Abrahams. Thank you so much. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Warm greetings in the precious name of our Lord Jesus today. Um, if I might just draw your attention, that's my wife sitting over there. Her name's Shanu, and our daughter, Claire. Uh, 
Uh, Shano and I have the privilege of being able to visit our family here in Brunei. Claire is a school teacher teaching at Tutong, has been there for the last two years. And um, so our eldest grandson is here in Brunei. And so it just was great to connect with him. On uh, the 1st of July, Shanu and I will have been married for 45 years. Thank you. Um, and out of that union have come two daughters, three grandchildren, and a very interesting life, as I'm sure many of you who've been married that long will know. Amen. So I have a, a number of slides that I would like to take you through, but just for a, a moment or so, let me ask you to think. What do you think your life and mine and the life of the world would have been like had Pentecost never occurred? If the Bible, the New Testament, stopped at the ascension, so we have the record and account of Christ's birth, all the prophecies prior to that, speaking of the coming of the Messiah, his birth, his life, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, and it ends there. No Holy Spirit. Would it be possible is it possible that we could still sing the songs we sing about the risen, crucified Savior, Lord of heaven and earth? What difference does the Holy Spirit make in our lives? Is the Holy Spirit incidental to the Christian life or is the Holy Spirit central? Unfortunately, a lot of us who are followers of Christ assume that we, we have everything in Christ alone. Little realizing that Christ himself never said that. That Christ himself, as we will see in the text, that Christ promises us a life that is quite distinct from the life that some of us think is normal, normal Christian life. There's a depth to this life there's a strength, there's a vitality, there's a joyfulness in this life that he's given to us that some of us perhaps today, I'm certainly, I've been praying for and hoping that this would happen, that there would be a, a real desire to know Christ in the way that he has revealed himself as the dispenser of the glorious gifts of God, particularly the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have heard and shared in the reading of our key text this morning, uh, John chapter 7, 37 to 39. <clears throat> However, in the early service this morning, and as part of your larger lectionary reading, Acts 2, 1 to 21 <clears throat> has been part of the reading. <clears throat> in the John 7 passage, the Lord invites people to a new kind of life, and in the Acts 2 passage, the Lord pours out his Holy Spirit, to make this new kind of life possible. We'll take, a, the, the path that we'll take this morning is, we'll have a brief look at Acts chapter 2, and then we'll take a deep dive into John's gospel. <clears throat> so, what happened on this day, Pentecost Sunday, many, many years ago? All of the events of that first Pentecost happened 50 days after Christ's resurrection. At day 40 after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. Before he ascended, he gathered his followers and said to them, gave them a very simple instruction, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then he said, uh, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So, he ascended, and his followers gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem. There were 120 of them. 
And during that time, they devoted themselves to prayer and to finding a successor for Judas, who had died, actually taken his life. On the 10th day, the day of Pentecost, this day, it was a day after the Jewish Sabbath. It was the first day of the week, the Sunday, as we celebrate it and have been for all these years. If you were there, your experience, you, you would have you would have considered all that is happening with wide-eyed wonder, with absolute awe. Because the first thing that you would have experienced was the shaking of of that room that you were in. You would have heard the sound of a violent, rushing wind. By the way, you wouldn't have been the only one to hear it. Those on the outside walking the streets of Jerusalem, and there were thousands there for, for that particular festival, they would have heard the same sound. They would have been intrigued, as you are, by what on earth is happening. And then, as soon as the wind died down, that slide showing flames of fire, Settling on every single one of the 120 people. The sign of the Holy Spirit. The sign of fire, power. Entering into every single one of them. They spilled out of the upper room into the streets below. Singing the praises of God. But the strange thing is, they never sang in their own language. They were all Hebrew speaking. Some Aramaic. But that day, they began to speak in languages that they had never learned. All the international languages that were present at the time. People from Rome heard them speak uh, Latin. People from various parts of Greece heard them speak in the Greek tongue and so forth. These were ordinary people. And and you, you have that slide showing people confused. How on earth is it that we hear these ordinary little traveled people speaking the praises of God in the language, in our languages. Where did, on earth did they learn it from? Of course they hadn't. This was the, the first phenomenal gift of the Holy Spirit given uh, to those early disciples. And so as they were pondering the question, what on earth is happening, somebody stood up among them and said, ah oh, man, easy to explain. These, these people have had new wine. So that, that explains it. Isn't it interesting how, how some people will lightly dismiss holy things, you know? And it was at that point that Peter stood up. You see him in his, I believe he's in that blue gown. Stood up among them and said, men of Galilee, you are quite mistaken if you think that these people are drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. All the places that sell liquor are closed. And then he says to them, this that you see is in fulfillment of an ancient prophecy made by the prophet Joel. And the prophecy, if you read through it in Acts chapter 2, simply says, in the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And so I will pour out my spirit on all. And there were a number of other phenomenal things mentioned in that prophecy. And Peter says, this that you see is in answer, in fulfillment to that prophecy. The spirit of God was spoken of years and years ago. It has now come to pass. Keep that question in mind, right? The one I raised right at at the commencement. What would our lives have been like had the Holy Spirit not come on that first Pentecost Sunday? And I'm hoping that we would look beyond the phenomena to look at the the, the essence, the significance of the coming of the Holy Spirit. What did that amount to? Now, here's the interesting thing. Peter talks to them about the prophecy concerning the coming of the Holy Spirit. In the next breath, he talks about Jesus. Jesus. He says, Jesus, a man accredited to you by God, by miracles, signs, and wonders, was taken and crucified. 
But he didn't stay in the, in the tomb. Three days later, he was raised to life. And God has put his stamp of blessing over this man by regarding, by, by showing him uh, to be the Messiah. And this one you crucified. So the people, as they heard Peter speak, they were, they were deeply concerned. They were convicted by the, the, uh, just the power of the Holy Spirit. And they asked, what shall we do? Peter said, which has become the formula for salvation in Christ. Repent, turn away from your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Two things there. Believe in Jesus and be baptized as a follower of his, and you will receive the gift <coughs> that my father promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Four things. Repent, believe in Jesus, be baptized in his name, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, many years ago when I considered this fourfold progression of events, I had to ask myself, have I experienced a, a true spiritual birth or has, my, has the spiritual birth somehow been, uh, you know, uh, is it lacking something? Was there true repentance on my part? Was there true faith in Christ? I knew there was true faith in Christ. I knew there was baptism in water. That had happened. <clears throat> but I wasn't certain about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so I had to deal with God on those two issues. Repentance, turning away from dead works, turning away from sin, turning away from an empty life of ritual, religion, and embracing now a new life, the life in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And I must tell you, since those days of seeking after God in that way, my Christian life took leaps forward. <clears throat> Before, I was a struggling Christian, struggling with all kinds of things, with thoughts that were not Christ-like, with words that dishonored the Lord, with sin that easily tripped me over, struggled, struggled. And, and never really understood that there's a power available to us as Christians that deals with every one of those human problems that we face. But more than just the spirit given to help us deal with problems, there were so many other things that I didn't understand, which I'm hoping that you and I will be able to cover today. After Pre Peter preached the, the gospel to them, talked to them about Christ, 3,000 people committed their lives to Christ on that day and were baptized. And so began the church. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. It was born in a blaze of glory on that particular day. And you and I, who are members of the church, whether you are members of St. Andrew's Church or whether uh, you know, I'm part of another church and across the road you've got the Roman Catholic Church, if we all have been united to Christ by the Spirit of God, made one in Christ, we've also been made one with each other. So we possess the life of Christ within us by His Spirit. Um, and, and baptism is that sign. And so the, the church grew from 3,000 to, oh, multiplied millions up to now, 2023. Now, that was a cursory look at Acts chapter 2. Deep dive into John chapter 7. Here's the text. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone, is, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So, one of the things that I, I'm hoping in my discussions with, um, excuse me, Bishop Andy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is to, uh, to arrange training sessions for people who are interested to study the Bible correctly, to gain the most out of the study of God's Word. And then some might progress beyond that to actually teaching God's word. And I know that 
a, a big concern of your church is the developing of leaders to conduct small group activities and preachers all the time. And so I'm hoping to be able to do that as well. So for just a little while, I'll put on my trainer's cap because that's what I do back in South Africa, train a whole lot of preachers in, in, the, in, the, in the art of biblical preaching. And really what that simply means is to discover what the Bible says. So what do the words mean? We've read three verses. What do these words mean? When you observe carefully, you've got to ask questions like that. What do these words mean? The, word, the words in, in, in blue, the feast. What feast is this? Is it significant? Mention is made of the great day. Why is it that this day was singled out in this particular passage? What is great about the great day? And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, if anyone thirsts, what does that mean? Thirsty for what? We know when you are thirsty for water, for a drink, we know that thirst. Are there other kinds of thirsts? What is in the mind of the Lord? If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. What does that mean? How do you come to a person and drink from a person? How do you understand that? You see, I think one of the problems that we all have as Christians is that we read the Bible rather carelessly, not carefully. We don't ask enough questions and we don't try to find out, you know, what does it mean? And hopefully we will be able to do some of that. Then Jesus said, whoever believes in me, what does that mean? Does it mean intellectually accept the fact that Jesus Christ was born or does it mean something more than that? As the scripture has said, what scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water? What is the heart? Is it the pump? Is it the figurative? Is, is that word being used figuratively or literally? Uh, rivers of living water. What on earth is that? Out of your heart. So let's say your heart is the innermost part of your being. If you come to me and drink from me, as the Bible says, rivers of living water will flow out of you. If, if it means anything at all, it simply means this, that there's a quality of life that many Christians have not yet experienced, which is described in these words, rivers of living water will flow out of you. By the way, for those of you that are familiar with the Gospels, you do know that Jesus used similar language before. In the same Gospel of John, when he spoke to a woman at the well, she was drawing water from the well. Interesting, the, the idea of water features in this passage, we'll see in a moment, and it features there at the woman at the well. Drawing water, Jesus comes alongside, please, will you give me a drink of water? She says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How is it that you're asking me for a drink? We don't share utensils. Jesus then said, if only you knew who it was, who it is, that's asking you for a drink. You would ask him, and he would give you living water. Living water? What on earth is that? Jesus then said, the water you are drinking will make you come back for more. Again and again, it won't satisfy you. But the water I give you will become in you a spring of living water. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. Same language. Rivers of living water, springs of living water. So it's promising another kind of life, a deeper, fuller, richer kind of life. And there are many of us who are sitting in all of our churches who are living with, in the shallows with a kind of spiritual life that is not satisfying at all. And if anything should pique our interest today, it should be that. Is there really another kind of life? A life that I have never yet experienced. And how do I get it? And do I qualify for it? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to answer those questions. So let's just see. Uh, we're going to be looking at the feast and the great day in just a little while. We'll, we'll have a look at that and we'll try to work through all of the others. And then John 7, 39. You'll notice a shift. In 37 and 38, Jesus speaks. In 39, Jesus doesn't speak. The narrator speaks. This is John himself. So there's four questions that, that appear in red. Who is speaking? What does he say? What does he mean? 
And do these words help us understand what Jesus is saying? Now, this he said about the Spirit whom, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There's a whole lot of words in, in blue that need some clarification. So, immediately you're beginning to see, ah, so when Jesus said, come to me and drink, he meant the spirit. You can't drink from a man. What is there that you can drink? But if the spirit is in him, and if the spirit is so powerfully present in Jesus, that means you can drink from his spirit. And I think that's really what he meant. Drink from my spirit. I have enough to give you and to give the world. Enough to satisfy your thirst. In fact, you might come to me thirsty. I'll give you so much that the water will not only take your thirst away, but it will become a river inside of you. Thirsty men and women become receptacles of rivers of living water. Marvelous. It meant the spirit. And then John says, makes it very clear, he's talking about the spirit who, who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So there's a sequence of events in the Bible. It's always very logical. It's always very sequential. It never makes, it's never confusing. First, Christ had to come. He had to die. He had to be raised from the life. He had to be, he had to ascend. And then, in his ascension, he poured out the Holy Spirit. So, John is saying, Jesus was not yet glorified. He was raised to life, but not yet raised to glory. But on the day of ascension, he was. So this event happened before the ascension, before Pentecost. And so John is just simply cl clarifying things for us. Just so that nobody gets confused about the sequence of events in the Bible. Okay? So, here are three keys. And we'll... we'll Try to work through it, hopefully not, not taking too much time. If you want to ever learn to study the Bible and get the most out of it yourself, if the Bible appears to be a closed book, how do you unlock it? There's three keys to unlock the doors. The one is observation. You observe as much as there is to observe. And you ask a simple question in your observation. What does this text mean? That's why you're observing. Then you interpret what does this text, sorry, observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? And application, how does God want me to respond? If you work through every Bible text with those three uh, ideas, first, observe everything that you can observe. Because this is the word of God that's been given for us to, to see, to hear, to read. Uh, what does it mean? It doesn't, it really matters very little if you know what it says, but don't, you don't understand what it means. So you've got to get to the meaning, the interpretation of scripture. And then finally, you've got to know how to act. What must you do now that you understand what God is saying? So if we go back to, uh, let me just see what's, yeah, let's just touch on this in a, for now. When you look at the text, and it's three verses. You must also look at something called the historical context. That means what's happening at this time? What's going on? Then you look at the literary context. That means we only looked at 37 to 39. What is going on before 37? What is said before 37? And what is said after 39? Because, as you would have heard, if you take a text out of its context, it becomes a pretext. It's not truth any longer. Learn to read it in its literary context, in the, in the words that surround it. And then there's a social and religious context that is here in this passage of Scripture. Try to understand that. And it's really not too hard. There, there are ways in which to discover it. There are enormous helps to, uh, to, to help us work through that. So in a moment, we're going to be looking at a video to discover the historical setting to find out what is actually happening here. 
Jesus said these words, come to me, all who are thirsty. What was the context? Was Jesus sitting at the, uh, you know, was he at the Lake of Galilee? Where everything was uh, calm? Uh, w- was he talking to a, um, a responsive crowd of people? W- who was he talking to? You know, where was it happening? Right. Uh, then you, in, as you look at the historical setting, it's a, a video clip that takes this very passage and extends it up to 25, verse 25, and right to the end of the chapter. Then we'll understand the verses that came before and after, all right? It's very, very important that we do that. Can we show the video, please? Some of the people of Jerusalem said, Jerusalem Isn't said, this the man the authorities are trying to kill? Look, he is talking in public, and they say nothing against him. Can it be that they really know that he is the Messiah? But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. And we all know where this man comes from. As Jesus taught in the temple, he said in a loud voice, Do you really know me? And know where I am from? I have not come on my own authority. He who sent me, however, is truthful. You do not know him, but I know him. Because I come from him. And he sent me. Then they tried to seize him. because his hour had not yet come. But many in the crowd believed in him. When the Messiah comes, will he perform more miracles than this man has? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering these things about Jesus. So they and the chief priests sent some guards to arrest him. I shall be with you a little while longer. And then I shall go away to him who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. Because you cannot go where I will be. The Jewish authorities said among themselves, where is he about to go so that we shall not find him? Will he go to the Greek cities where our people live and teach the Greeks? He says that we will look for him but will not find him, and that we cannot go where he will be. What does he mean? On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Whoever is thirsty should come to me, and whoever believes in me should drink. As the scripture says, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his side. Jesus said this about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were going to receive. At that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not been raised to glory. Some of the people in the crowd heard him say this. This man is really the prophet! The Messiah will not come from Galilee! The Scripture says that the Messiah will be a descendant of King David and will be born in Bethlehem the town where David lived. So there was a division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. When the guards went back, the chief priests and Pharisees asked them, Why did you not bring him? Nobody has ever talked the way this man does. Did he fool you too? Have you ever known one of the authorities or one Pharisee to believe in him? This crowd does not know the law of Moses. So they are under God's curse. One of the Pharisees there was Nicodemus, the man who had gone to see Jesus before. 
According to our law, we cannot condemn people before hearing them and finding out what they have done. Well, are you also from Galilee? <laughs> Study the scriptures, and you will learn that no prophet ever comes from Galilee. another and it had to do with where they thought Jesus came from some said he comes from Galilee others said but he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee search the scriptures and you'll see that to be true the Messiah is a descendant of David confusion about where he comes from ultimately comes from they had no idea that Jesus was neither from Galilee nor from Bethlehem that he was from another place had no idea. But before long, some in that crowd would discover that. <clears throat> His disciples, first of all, would, would know that. But there was confusion. There was division among them. That was the setting of the time. <clears throat> now, why is that important? Both the, 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 the social, religious setting of tabernacles, the celebration of tabernacles or living in booths, why was that important? Why was this hostility important? Um, here, I think, is what... Let, let me just show you some of these, uh, these pictures that, I, that we have here. So, remember we asked the question, what is the feast and what's the great day of the feast? So, it's the feast of booths, shelters, or tabernacles. Uh, there you have, on the one hand an image of what, would have, what it would look like then in ancient Israel, people building uh, simple booths with uh, branches of, from trees on the top. The top right-hand picture, exactly the same, a family gathering. It was very much a family gathering. They lived in booths for seven days. They did everything. They slept there usually, uh, ate there. You know, children loved it. It was like, Seven days of Christmas. Uh, bottom right, you have what is probably in, in present-day Israel and uh, these Jewish leaders building their booths um, to dwell in. This was the time that this took place. Now, yet the, why the last day, the great day? Well, something happened on that great day. Um, the priests would leave the temple, top left. They'd leave the temple with, with trumpets blazing, blaring. They'd get to what is called the Pool of Siloam, which is an ancient pool of water that drew in water from the outside into the city. They took golden pitchers, they filled it with water, then they traveled back to the temple 
and they walked around the altar at the temple and the priests would pour out the water. And scholars say that it was at that moment, Jesus at the temple, when the water was being poured out, that said these words, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. It was a wonderful opportunity for Christ to explain this. You don't, you don't have him say this, these words anywhere else. First to the woman at Samaria, slightly different words. First time and only time he says it here. And it, it, it makes sense because it happens at the time when the water is being poured out. And that water is a reminder that the Lord gave them water to drink in the desert. The Lord sheltered them in the desert. It was a reenactment of the 40 years of their time in the desert. Um, you, might, you might know these two passages. So, so it was on that occasion that Jesus then stood up among them and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. <clears throat> yeah, you have a calmer crowd, but as we saw in that clip, the, calm, the crowd was far from calm. Volatile, hostile, divisive. You might recall this, connecting the festival of booze and what happened there to Exodus. Exodus 17, the Lord said to Moses, yes, at a time when people were desperately thirsty, no water, wandering around for a long while, and they cried out for water. They say, we are thirsty, we are ready to die. Moses cries out to God, and the Lord says to Moses, take some of the leaders of Israel with you and go on ahead of the people. Take along the stick with which you struck the Nile. I will stand before you on a rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. They all knew that. It's part of their, 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 their scriptures. When our ancient people traveled through, Moses struck the rock. Water came out of the rock. What does Paul say about that rock? 1 Corinthians 10. Paul says, I want you to remember, my friends, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. And then they drank from the spiritual rock that went with them. And that rock was Christ himself. Wonderful tie-ins to Old Testament events, to Christ now. He is the rock from which water pours out, life-giving water. He remains the source of life-giving water, living water, even now, though the, the images have, uh, have different, slightly different meanings. Now, here's another passage in Isaiah. Great, great passage. I will give water to the thirsty land and make streams flow on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your children and my blessing on your descendants. They will thrive like well-watered grass, like willows by streams of running water. The idea, again, of water, spirit, and fullness of God's blessing. As we come to a close today, there are three questions that I want us to ask and attempt to answer. Is there really such a thing as a truly satisfying life? Some of us might say, no, I've never discovered it yet. I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian for a long, long while, but I, if I'm honest, I don't think my life is as satisfying as I had hoped it would be. And what is the secret of this life? And who qualifies to receive this life? Those three questions. Now, let's get back to the event. Here's a, the clamoring noises of people saying one thing and saying another thing. And in the midst of that, Jesus speaks and says in a loud voice, come to me, all who are thirsty. Ah, now here's something we mustn't forget, that we mustn't overlook. In the midst of people asking so-called intellectual questions about who is he, where has he come from, da, 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 there were other people in their midst who were asking questions, but those questions were not articulated. It was the question of the soul. 
The soul has questions itself. And the questions of the soul are these. Is there any truth in religion, in a life, in, a, in spiritual life? Is there any truth? Is it true that God does give new life? Others have said he has. When you come to a worship service like you do, we did both services, the traditional service, E1 and now yours, there's an exuberance here. Underlying the idea of exuberant worship is the idea that some people have discovered a secret to worship that others might be on looking on and wondering about. I know I was in that position. I see people, you know, praising God, speaking in languages that none of us know, uh, joyful faces, and I'm saying, is that real? I haven't experienced it. I can tell you it is absolutely real. But it is an experience for all of us to have. Okay? But, oh, the point I'm making is that there is, is there really such a thing as a satisfying life? And satisfying on, on what level? Is there a life that is satisfying on an intellectual level that where every question is answered, where everything makes sense, where you're not left in any doubt about anything? When you ask the question about who is God, there's an answer. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask, is there life after death? A satisfying answer is given. This faith, the faith that Jesus has come to give to us, uh, is absolutely satisfying. It's satisfying on a deeper level, at the level of the soul. It's very satisfying there. Um, when the soul... And, and there's, I think, the meaning of the word thirst. What do people thirst for? They thirst for truth. They, tr they thirst for true knowledge. Nothing, nothing fictitious or made up. And they thirst for a real experience of life. All of us are tired of pretending to live life. All of us want the real thing. And when we've captured the real thing, we don't let go of it. Unfortunately, there are a number of Christian people who pretend to have the real thing. Well, when you scratch the veneer a little beneath the surface, you realize it's all pretense. It's all, all hypocrisy. There is, in the midst of that, there is a real kind of life, deeply satisfying to the hunger of every person. There's young men and women who are here. You're starting off your Christian life. Some of you, you're here because your parents want you to be here. Your parents have discovered something in this faith, and they're saying, you will discover it too, but you haven't yet discovered it. There's other things that you, you're thirsty for. You're thirsty for knowledge, a career, studying, finding a partner. Those are the things that interest you now. You, you're not really interested in that. So there is a life. And I'll come back to that word thirst in a moment. What's the secret of this life? You'll be interested to know. The scriptures give us the answer. We don't have to guess at it. It's come to Jesus, and when you come to Jesus, he will give you the Holy Spirit. Two, two parts. We can't go to the Holy Spirit without coming to Jesus. So, I mean, that's just a done deal. First come to Jesus. And he invites us to. He says, come. Whoever's thirsty, come and let him drink, and out of his being will flow rivers of living water. By this, he meant the Spirit whom they would receive later. All right? So there's the secret to this life. You come to Jesus, you believe in Jesus, and you receive from Jesus. What do you receive? This new life, this life in the Spirit. And who qualifies to receive this life? I'm so glad the Bible didn't say this. You have to be... Your, your moral life has to be at a level of perfection before you can receive this life. You have to be good at the level of Mother Teresa or Pope Francis or that level. Goodness, there's no hope for any of us. But what qualifies us? Two things. The invitation is come to me, believe in me, and receive from me. Two preconditions. Whoever's thirsty and whoever believes in Jesus. I'm quite certain that a whole lot of you who are here believe in Jesus already. Otherwise, why come to church on a Sunday morning? You could go and play sport. You could, you know, fly a kite. You could do 101 other things. 
You believe in Jesus. But are you thirsty enough to want this kind of life that he alone can give you? Are you thirsty? You look everywhere in the New Testament and you discover that it's only thirsty people that receive something from God. People who, who are full, there's no room for thirst. They're full of their own ideas, their own importance, their own, own, own. They never come to him. They never receive anything from him. But you have, you have Matthew, the tax collector, discarded by his own people, coming to Jesus when he says, come and follow me. You have the woman at the well coming to Jesus. You have all of those who have a thirst for something more, and Jesus satisfies that thirst. So there's the qualification. Those are the preconditions, whoever's thirsty and whoever believes in me. So this thirst, let's talk about that for just a few minutes. What is it? First of all, before we answer the question, what is it? This thirst could be a conscious thirst. You could be conscious that you are lacking something. You know it. And as I'm speaking to you, you can say, ah, that's the thing. I've been struggling with. I've been thirsty for more of God, for more of this new kind of life that only God can, that only, that can come only from the Lord. And then there's a subconscious thirst. You're not even aware that there's a thirst. But there's that word restlessness. You're restless. You've got a good job, but you're restless. You've got a good marriage, but you're restless. You've got lots of money, but you're restless. And you have, you've You've tried to put your finger on the cause of your restlessness. Listen to what St. Augustine in one of his writings said. Thou hast formed us for thyself and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. You'll remain restless. Young as you are now until you're older, restless until you find that rest, place of rest in Christ. All right, there's something else that Augustine said that I don't think we need to bother ourselves with. We end with the prayer that I would ask you to first read with me, and then if you feel inclined to, you might want to pray it. The first prayer is the prayer for a person who already knows, man, I, I, I've always been wanting a better kind of Christian life, deeper, fuller, more joyful, the kind of life that Jesus says, I've come to give you life in all of its fullness. I don't have that. So you're aware of it. Yours is a conscious awareness of thirst. That top prayer is your prayer. And please don't bother yourself with the size of the prayers. Really not that. It's the, the heart. Your prayer goes something like this. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Lord Jesus, I call to thee. Remember, it's call upon him, believe in him, and receive from him. Fill me with your spirit. As the Father sent you, send me to do your bidding, O Lord. So yes, and you could put your own words to that, but basically it's a prayer of a person who knows the reality of the thirst. And the second prayer is a prayer that I prayed. <laughs> I prayed that prayer, and I taught people at our church to pray that prayer as well. Because I know that at that time, I wasn't thirsty for God. There were lots of other things I was thirsty for. I had desires for many other things, but not for the one thing that God has for me. That prayer. Create in me a thirst for you, God. Ask him for a thirst if you don't have it. Create in me a thirst for you, God. Take away my desire for lesser things. Create in me a desire to know thee, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, to love thee more dearly. Send thy spirit upon me, O Lord, and cause me to do thy will. Amen. So let's have a moment while you look at the prayer in front of you. Choose the prayer that you think you'd like to make. Use the words. Add your own words. But it's your time with God for just a moment. And then we conclude. I will conclude in a prayer.
How wonderful it is to know, Lord, that you know us better than we know ourselves. We don't know whether there's a thirst strong enough to desire the things that you speak about in your word. For many of us, we know there is no thirst because other things take higher priority. And we pray, Lord, for all of us that you would narrow our priorities down to one single focus, that we would desire the life that Christ has to offer, life in Christ, life in the Spirit, that that would be our sole desire. Today, Lord, we pray that you would take every other desire from us, strip us from these things, and leave us alone and naked before thee with one single passionate desire, the desire for God and the life that God alone can give. Because we know, Jesus told us, that it would be a thoroughly satisfying life, a life like rivers of living water flowing from within us, nothing dry in us, nothing dead in us, everything alive in us. That's what we pray for today, Lord. We ask that you would hear our prayer. We come to you today, Lord Jesus. We know that we believe in you. And we come to receive from you that which you alone give, your Holy Spirit. Lord, we asked a question when we began. What would our lives be without Pentecost, without the coming of the Spirit? It would be empty. It would be not a river. It would be a trickle, a dried up riverbed. It would, there would be deadness. No, nothing living, nothing alive, no joy but with the coming of the Holy Spirit who connects us to Christ, the living God, and brings Christ's life into us. Lord, we thank you for your Spirit, and we ask that you would baptize many, many in this gathering with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would begin in the heart and mind of every person here a search, a holy quest to know God in his fullness. And none of us will stop searching until we have found that, that pearl of great price, that life which is life indeed. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for that word. May we as a church continue to thirst for him and may we be filled with his living waters. May we all rise to declare the Nicene Creed together as a church. Together, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not me, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated, church. And now we have for us a few notices from the church office. Firstly, we would like to welcome all those who are here to visit or all those who are new to our church. So first, we would like to welcome Joshua Che from Korea. He is visiting. If you could raise your hand, wave at us so we can know who you are. Okay. Sorry. He's gone home already? Okay. That's fine. Benjamin Ho and family from Singapore. Good morning. We're glad to have you this morning. Janet Rilopi from the Philippines. 
Good morning. And Danette Reynolds from South Africa. Good morning. So we're so glad to have all of you here at our church. We hope that you've been blessed by our worship, the message, as well as our singing. Uh, we would like to get to know a little bit more about you. So if we could have you to join us at the breakfast area just outside this hall, our hospitality team would love to get to know you. And to the rest of us who are always here in church, we're glad to see you again here this morning. Some notices for us. Firstly, we would like to give our condolences to Lim Go Chi, Alan and Anna Saikawa on the passing of their beloved husband, father and father-in-law, Jimmy Chin. Jimmy Lim, sorry. Some of you may, have, may know him. Um, if you know him, maybe you could send a word of condolence to the family. And at this moment, can we just take a minute to just pray for the family? Thank you, God. The next notice that we have for you is about our small group leaders training. So for those of you who are leaders, you would probably have already signed up. So this is just a reminder that our first session is this Tuesday, 30th of May. Take note of these dates. For those of you who have not signed up yet or if you're not available for the first round of, um, for the first round of training, the next round is in August, so take note of those dates, but also please register with the church office. Next, we have on the 31st of May, which is a public holiday, uh, we have an event by our cool ministry. So for those of you who are keen to come and join this bring and share picnic, it is happening at Eco Park, which is in Bandar over there. And it's from 3.45 p.m. to 6 p.m. For those of you interested, you can contact Dr. Adrian uh, or Yachi. They are the food coordinator as well as the event coordinator. So this is open to all families, not just if you have children in cool ministry, but all families. There's going to be fellowship, games, exercise, and food. Next, also on the 31st of May, considering it is a public holiday, we will not be having our uh, prayer meeting happening on church grounds um, and not even on Zoom, but we want to say that the upper room is open for anybody who would like to come and join prayer. Just um, come and pray on your own. It's open from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Otherwise, we hope that you have a good rest holiday on the 31st of May. On the 2nd of June, Yes, on the 2nd of June, which is this Friday at 4.30 p.m., there is a baptism service. So we're so glad to invite people into our family of Christ. If you, like, if you know anybody who is going to be baptized, this is just a reminder that the service is this Friday. But for those of you who would still like to come and celebrate with our Baptists, those who will be baptized, you are very much welcome. <laughs> And there's also the confirmation service that's happening on the 11th of June, which is in two Sundays' time. So that is during the Bahasa service at 12.45 p.m. Next, we have an um, event that's happening for young adults. So this is happening on the 30th of June. It is a Friday. Please take note of this date. Put it in your calendar now. 7.30 p.m. the event will start. The venue is yet to be confirmed. Um, they've confirmed it as a team, but uh, it will be known to us soon. And the tickets will be on sale next Sunday onwards. So if you know any young adults who would, like, who would greatly benefit from this event, Please let them know, and for those of you who are already young adults, uh, take note of this event. It's happening on the 30th of June. And next, we have a video for us to watch, uh, so fix your eyes on the screen. Some of the people of Jerusalem said, isn't this the man, Leof? Delphian, on behalf of La Vida Berhag, I wanted to 
invite everyone to join and support us in the upcoming charity concert fundraiser 2023. And this event will be held at St. Andrew's Church on the 23rd and 24th of June 2023. The event will start at 7.30 and ends up to Hello 9. everyone, I'm Delphian. I wanted to invite everyone in the upcoming charity concert fundraiser 2023. And this event will be held at St. Andrew's Church on the 23rd and 24th of June 2023. The event will start at 7.30 and ends up to 9. And in the event itself, we will also have pop-up book sales which started as early as 6 p.m. onwards. And what do we want to expect in the event? There will be lineup from classical music, pop music, string assembly, worship dance, ballad, and many more. Through this event, your support will go through the community development work in La Vida. In La Vida, we have our motto, which says, we serve because we care. Through the motto itself, we see most of problems and issue faces by the community in the region itself. One of it is the underprivileged side, the special needs, and also people who live in the rural areas who face challenges, especially in individual and as well for families. Those are the main concerns for them to understand the quality of life. La Vida Community Development Work is to emphasize support and empowerment. It's to organize workshop for families. La Vida also educate educational aid and services, advocate of inclusion and developing partnerships at workplace and community, also to interact and build social connection with any organization. One of uh, La Vida community development works are called the Youth Service Learning, which is done by the youth. And this is to bring awareness of poverty and also its dimension by doing baseline research on the needs of the community, training on organizing relief aid and giving opportunity to organize and execute project as part of youth development. The purpose is to allow them to empathize with the families, gain a better understanding of their struggles and discover other ways to provide help to them and the community as a whole. As part of La Vida Community Development Work, we encourage everyone to come, join, support us, also join to organize and execute project as part of the community development. We are open, we are always ready, we are always welcome for others to learn and join. By doing this, we learn and we develop soft and collaborative skills. Book your tickets today, support local talents and community development work. And I would like to say thank you for your support. For more details on the event, you can contact Cynthia with the number and also La Vida hotline number. Thank you, everyone. I invite all of us to stand for our offertory.
Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. All this we give back to you. It's such a small token of what you have given us, God, but we ask that you would take it and you would use it for the expansion of your kingdom. We thank you, God. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we continue on with our, the closing of our service. So let's remain standing.
we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit. May we be filled, Lord, Father, with your living water. As the word says, God, I pray, O oh, Father, that your word will lead us, O oh, Father. Let it flow, Lord. Let the, river, the rivers of living water flow, Lord, Father, in and through us. God, I pray, Father, that you will just even use us, Lord, to be witnesses for your kingdom. Not just in this place, but in everywhere that we're going to go from here. In Jesus' name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. Service is over, church, and see you next week. <laughs>